Welcome to Tech Talks, the conversation series of the Psychology of Technology Institute. This is a conversation with Iyad Rowan, Azim Sharif, and Jean-Francois Bonafon. The three of them are collaborators on the Moral Machine Project, an online platform that surveyed millions of people about the moral dilemmas faced by autonomous cars. Through their experiments, they've uncovered fascinating insights about the complex trade-offs involved in deploying advanced AI systems in society. We hope you love the conversation. Could I have the three of you introduce yourself, where you work, and what your sort of specialty is? that brings you this project. So Jean-Francois, if you want to start. Hey, I'm Jean-Francois Bonfond. I work in France in the Toulouse School of Economics, but my PhD is in psychology. And Azim? I am Azim Sharif. I am a uh, social psychologist at the University of British Columbia, specializing in, specializing in morality. And yeah. My PhD is also in psychology. Okay. Uh, I'm Iyad Rahwan. I work at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin, but uh, I'm a computer scientist by background. And so, so how did the three of you uh, sort of come together on this, this question, these questions about autonomous cars and about AI more generally, given, I mean, obviously, Iyad, you have a computer science background, but uh, how did you discover that you sort of had a, a common lens that you could bring to this set of questions? Iyad was the one who kind of rallied the troops together on this. He, he knew Jean-Francois and me independently. Uh, he and I met when I was uh, teaching down at NYU's campus in Abu Dhabi. Um, and this is when he worked at the Mazdar Institute, which was an institute which had these faux self-driving cars. Uh, it, was a, it was this attempt to have a futuristic institution. And he cold called me. I was the only social psychologist for miles around. And so he... Uh, he called me out and we, uh, we, we started our conversations and, and he'd already known Jean-Francois and he connected the three of us. Got it. Yeah, I must say that I, I contacted Azim on the encouragement of Jean-Francois. So I was thinking, I remember we, were, we wanted to run a study. So I had already cold called uh, Jean-Francois a few years beforehand when I was uh, attending a conference on computational argumentation in Toulouse. And I found his work fascinating. And I asked if he would be interested in having lunch. I don't think he was even attending the conference. And uh, I think we got along well and we uh, wrote a paper together. And then um, a few years later, uh, we needed to run to gather subjects, experimental subjects and to have somebody local. And I didn't know how to, to do this properly. So I started searching for like psychologists within the, within the country and came across Jean, uh, Azim and Jean-Francois, I remember telling me, I would love to work with Azim. Like he, it looked like he knew of Azim beforehand, um, mm -hmm. but I, I hadn't. And uh, that's how we met. So this is kind of the initial, and, and we worked on one other project before uh, on like social learning and uh, uh, kind of intuitive and versus analytical processing. So we were kind of already beginning to uh, work together and uh, had I think published one paper together and then this whole self-driving car thing started becoming more and more in the news and it's always like social commentary and philosophical commentary and legal commentary and in the meantime I was you know so I used to drive uh, <clears throat> in order to get to the zero carbon city which has all these four self-driving cars um, where we uh, Azim and I first met I would drive for an hour with my gasoline car, which is not very sustainable. Um, but that gave me a lot of time to listen to audiobooks. And one of the audiobooks I was listening to was Josh Green's Moral Tribes. And this is where I learned about all of this experimental work with the trolley problem. And uh, through conversations with these, uh, with Azim and Jean-Francois, I just felt like there would be, there's a great opportunity for doing experimental ethics on this problem. Oh, fascinating. Okay, so I, I didn't realize that that Josh Green's work had been one of the kind of initial uh, inspirations for this or, or things that got you thinking about it, because I, I have some questions later about the, the dual process model stuff you've done, and he sort of brings that dual process model lens to, to morality. So, okay, cool. So we'll, we'll get to that. Um, but keep in mind, keep in mind that it's a bit like the Joker's origin story in Nolan's Batman. Every time we tell that story, we tell a different story. So. I see. I see. Okay. Well, that that that, that particular one, uh, you know, is, is a very good narrative. So we'll stick with it for now. Um, okay. So just just um, to give people sort of the some of the relevant background here. So you even even just there, Yad, you mentioned that there are kind of philosophical, psychological 
technological and legal components to what you're doing here. They all sort of like, you know, melt, melt together or, or like they're relevant concepts from all those different disciplines that, that are, are uh, at play in, in the work you've done. So um, they're kind of, I, I, I set, I set, a, set it up as two, maybe there are more that you think would be relevant to bring into play, but, but I think it'd be especially important for people to understand this idea of a social dilemma and, and collective action problem to understand what's motivating your work. And then also that, that, um, the moral psychology work on autonomous cars is connected to a, a kind of legitimacy project of people finding the rules that autonomous cars abide by to be legitimate in a kind of political sense. Um, and I just want to sort of give people those two, two concepts. So does, does that, any one of you want to take up this idea of a, a social dilemma to give people the kind of broad explanation? Sure, I could. Michelle Frosa, do you want to do that? <laughs> no, go, please. Okay. So, uh, Building on a, a rich philosophical literature, um, and, and one that, like we talked about, Josh Green has done a lot to bring into psychology, uh, but there are many others involved, this idea of people living together faces particular challenges. And one of the challenges is that people have their self-interests. Uh, uh, oftentimes, those self-interests conflict with what would be best for the group. Um, and even what would be best for every individual within the group if they could develop some form of cooperation. And, and the most famous example of this is uh, probably Garrett Hardin's um, Tragedy of the Commons. Uh, and so there you have the, uh, a, num a number of farmers, they have a number of cattle and they're all grazing on a particular piece of grass. That's a sustainable amount if everybody only grazes a certain amount of grass, but every farmer is incentivized to get a little bit more believing that, well, that's all just a drop in the bucket. It, it means a lot more for them, but it means just a small addition to the cost on the group. But since everybody's motivated to do that, everybody pursuing their self-interest leads the grassland to be depleted. So it leads to a collective uh, good being depleted and everybody ends up worse off as a result. And so the challenge for a group is to figure out a way to get people to be able to resist uh, pursuing their, their self-interest to the point which ultimately ends up being destructive for the group. Uh, that, so that's, that's the basis of the, of, of, that's a type of social action problem. Got okay. And, and then um, the, the second, second concept, and maybe, the, maybe there's another one here, so uh, let me know if there's, there's another piece of theoretical background that you think would be useful, but it, it just struck me that, that I think when I first spoke with you, Iyad, I was very preoccupied with the kind of moral philosophy side of this, like what's the right answer for how these cars should behave, right? Like, like how do we get to the bottom of this as a matter of moral philosophy? And I, I think at the time you were, you were uh, reading uh, Fukuyama, Origins of Political Order, and we talked about it a little bit, but you, were, you, you kept sort of restating it in terms of how can we um, cause these, the, the, the algorithms that these cars abide by to be accepted as legitimate in a social context. And that's a, that's a different framing than like, how do we get to the bottom of this as a matter of normative moral philosophy. So could you just sort of explain the le legitimacy project there a little bit? Yeah, I guess the, I guess once you recognize that it's a social dilemma and it requires cooperation, you, and that therefore the problem is not really a, an objective kind of uh, question to which you can find the normative answer. I mean, even if you did find the normative answer, you know, we have a situation where people agree on the normative answer. You know, they do think that it's in the best interest of uh, autonomous, of everybody if autonomous vehicles would uh, minimize harm, but they just have this individual incentive to, to get autonomous vehicles that only look after their own safety. So they agree on the normative answer, but they can't get themselves to enforce it. Uh, and and then I think immediately you move from the realm of uh, normative philosophy to the realm of politics. Like how do people enforce agreements, political agreements? Well, you need some kind of you know uh, regulation with teeth or some kind of social contract or you know there's all sorts of names for it uh, on the theory and practice side of it. But you need a political mechanism basically for uh, first of all reaching agreement over uh, what is the normative answer that you want because people disagree on what normative answers are. Uh, should be, and then for enforcing it. There's a, a related question. Uh, so one of the interesting parts about this work is that that uh, when you encounter gaps between what uh, what people will accept on the machines doing and and uh, what what 
the machine itself would determine to be the right answer based on some some prescript prescriptive uh, idea. It 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 sort of it 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 poses interesting questions about moral philosophy more generally. Do you think that like moral questions in general are best considered to be um, subordinate to these coordination questions? Does that I don't know if that question makes sense. Do you, do you sort of know what I mean? Like maybe maybe the 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 coordination problems are more fundamental. And the moral philosophies are sort of emergent solutions to them, as opposed to this kind of inversion where you take the moral philosophy to be eternal and correct. Do, do, do you see what I mean? Whoa. <laughs> well, I, I don't mean I don't mean to sort of uh, take you too far afield, but this this did come up when when we were first speaking as the like you know I was like, but what what's the true answer you know? And th this this might be a, a sort of flip that that would be helpful for people. Yep. You know, one difference between the car and other coordination problem is like, for example, I mean, we, we all agree that it's better if people pay taxes. You know, it, it, we, we, we're gonna live in a better place if people pay their taxes, but if they don't. And so, of course, people would not pay the taxes if, they, if, it, if the, this were optional. So you have a government that make them mandatory. You know, you have to pay them or you go to jail. The thing is, it's okay when you can impose something like this, but with the cars, you cannot impose anything because ultimately people will vote with their wallets. They will buy the car or they will not. So in this case, the right answer sometimes is maybe not the one that would be correct from uh, an ideal ethical standpoint, but the one that will get people to buy the car, you know, in a way that minimizes harm as much as possible, but while taking into account the, the fact that people can always completely reject the technology. Mm. There's a kind of ought implies can angle there too. Like, like if, if people wouldn't buy the car that does the more ethical thing, well, what, what does it even mean to say it's the more ethical thing? You know? <laughs> that's right. Exactly. That's right. right. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, before I before I get too hung up on my my moral philosophical questions, I guess um, just as another piece of background here, uh, Yad, when we first spoke, we talked about this this moral imperative to introduce autonomous cars. So, and and that being a, a kind of a backdrop motivation for the work is is how essential it is that the rollout of autonomous cars not face any major hitches from, from a moral standpoint. Could, could you just sort of describe why it's so important that that process take place? Well, I think it's conditional, right? It's conditional on the cars being uh, substantially safer or, or not, or, or a little bit safer than human drivers, right? So if the introduction of the cars demonstrably uh, improves safety, you know, according, and, and this is a big question, you know, how do you actually demonstrate this technically? And how do you uh, actually quantify it? Uh, like, does it have to improve safety for every category of road users or some categories or just minimize, just have less people dead independent of how they distribute it? These are not, you know, um, obvious questions, but in, if they are in some way superior, then I think there is a moral imperative to uh, introduce them as, as soon as possible. But uh, both the presence of self-interest and uh, potential psychological um, biases may prevent people from adopting them for a variety of reasons. So I think our projects, uh, projects try to contribute to understanding the psychological mechanisms that may hinder this adoption um, so that we can find out where we might uh, overcome them, uh, whether it's through public, you know, uh, public communication, strategies or whether uh, political solutions, right? Political agree agreements and legitimacy and so on. With, with that, I don't know if they want, uh, Azim and Jean-Francois want to add something. We, we can get into the details at some point about all those psychological Yeah, yeah, so I, I, have, I have many more questions about the, the details of the experiments okay. and what you're okay. counting. Yeah. Um, let's see if I have, sort of, um, I guess I guess another, this relates to something we've spoken about before, but, but um, why well maybe this is something you've already answered but so why wouldn't it be the case that in deciding what kinds of moral trade-offs autonomous cars make the best thing to do is just consult the moral philosophers right so <laughs> just, just 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 figure out what the, what what the moral philosophers say is right uh have them work out the details and then and then and then turn it into a um a persuasion project so so We'll, I have more questions later about these sort of persuasiveness trade-offs, but why wouldn't you just start with the normative moral philosophy and then consider it to be a project of, of mere persuasion? So actually that, that the second part I agree with, you know, make it a persuasion project once you've 
you know, come to the most reasonable conclusion. The first part about having moral philosophers do it is doomed to fail you know, <laughs> because, because they will never agree on what is the correct solution. And I have, you know, intensive experience about asking them. There's Very also, good. I mean, there's, there's also the point that uh, one's assuming that a persuasion argument could work, right? So um, the, the point that Jean-Francois made earlier about the fact that this depends on the public acceptance, that's the, the sort of bedrock here, right? If, if, if they can't, if people aren't willing to buy the self-driving cars or if other stakeholders put up such outrage over the types of self-driving cars that are being sold, that it's an unfeasible consumer project. Uh, it doesn't matter what the moral philosophies are, are agreed upon. Um, if they can persuade us, uh, then, then that can solve some of the problems, but humans might be constrained in what they're persuaded to be able to do. Mm. I, guess, I guess maybe I would add to this that maybe this is what, in a way, the role of moral philosophers is, I mean, historically, and, and I'm not a historian of like moral, you know, political philosophy by any stretch, but, but I think that if you think about the roles that moral philosophers have played in the past, it seems to be that they formalize concepts and then uh, they try to sell them, right? Like they, they, these concepts kind of compete in a marketplace of legitimacy or uh, uh, political support, whether it's convincing the king that this is the way that you should run things or whether it's convincing the public that this is how you should, you know, you should vote for the person who, who promotes these principles. But, but you know, they, they, they help us kind of uh, crystallize uh, various principles. But in the end, those principles need to be adopted and you know, in the marketplace for competing principles. So I think this is nothing new and, and, and it's not like they have no role to play. Just don't, don't know if, um, I don't think they're sufficient. I'm, I'm, hear, I'm hearing sort of echoes of, of that idea that, that maybe the moral philosophy is, is subordinate to the coordination problems, right? Like, like it's, it's sort of about what the, the moral philosophers can get, can get to be adopted as much as it is about its normative truth. I mean, I guess you could say subordinate, but also you could say that without somebody coming up with the idea of cooperation, somebody coming up with the, you know, like Azim has been studying, you know, the idea of God, right? Like somebody had to come up with, with this notion and then convince others, you know, this is, without this, we wouldn't have modern civilization. Like, so in a way that, you know, who's subordinate to who in, right? At what scale, what time scale? So. Yeah. Many, many interesting threads here. Okay, um, so I guess, okay, so I, I guess we should just jump, jump, jump into the details here. So, so um, the moral machine experiment, could you explain sort of what the, what the backdrop frame is? I know you've run multiple different experiments and, and, and published multiple papers on it, but what's the sort of broad, broad uh, description of the experiment and, and how it was set up and, and what kinds of questions you were trying to answer? Maybe take this, you know, when, uh, when we started working on these issues, we started with uh, very simple cases. You know, you've got this car, it's gonna crash into one person, but you know, or it's gonna crash into five persons, sorry, but it could also crash in one person. What should it do? So with these simple cases, we could extract some basic principles. People seem to prefer to save many lives. But very soon we started thinking, okay, but what if one of this person is a kid? You know, what if it's a pregnant woman? What if, and so on and so on. But then, you know, very, very quickly, we realized we were looking at millions of scenarios. And so we could not, we could just not make classic social science survey. You know, you don't call up people on the phone to ask them questions when you have 1 million questions. So what we did was to build this website, which is essentially throwing cases at you when you visit the website. And it uh, froze those cases, it, they, they are picked in a huge database of scenarios. And the key, of course, of the project was to make it viral because that was the only option for us to get enough people to look at this massive databases of scenarios that we had. And so the whole moral machine project was really, you know, how can we make this thing viral? You know, and we're social scientists, not you know, influencers <laughs> or anything. So that was quite the challenge. It's a bit like the, the moral philosophy is having an adoption strategy, right? You need an adoption strategy to just answer the, the, the questions that you were, you were trying to ask. So that's cool. Um, so how, how de deliberate or like how, um, how much was it a, a part of your initial thinking 
the way that this relates to the moral philosophy questions about trolley problems. So I know you mentioned Josh Green's work as being an inspiration, but I couldn't quite tell whether you're like, oh, trolley problems are an interesting way of shedding light on moral questions, so we should ask them, or autonomous cars questions just are trolley problems in some sense. So, so it's a sort of natural comparison. But, but how much were you thinking about the original sort of Philip foot thought experiments? Part of it was that there was prior to our doing the very first study. So the uh, one key difference between the very first study that we did using traditional methods before the Moral Machine website was that we were asking about this distinction between what people think is the is the moral thing to do and what they would want their own car to do, right? So it was pitting one's own self-interest against what one perceived to be the moral moral thing. The question about the moral thing had been in the air already with in, in the context of self-driving cars. We, we, of course, were not the first people to, to apply uh, the, the trolley problem to the self-driving car discussion. We just brought some empirical data to it. And so um, I think people for a while had recognized that this is both a, um, a, a real world applied example of what had been hitherto a, a, a very abstract uh, uh, philosophical question um, and something which could potentially shed light on this actual applied issue within, within the self-driving car sphere. So in, in a way it was both, and in a way we were taking our cues from a discussion which existed before. By the time we got to the moral machine, it had expanded considerably beyond just the, the five versus one distinction, right? The, the utilitarian comparison between just uh, numbers of people um, was just one of the many, many moral dimensions that was involved. Right. So, so by the way, you remember that at some point we, we circled back and we made a special section on the moral machine with the standard trolley scenarios, you know, as discussed by philosophers, just out of curiosity, right? Because we wanted to know about these uh, classic cases too. And on the, uh, on the question about trying to make this viral and trying to make it appealing to the public, we called these the, the moral machine classic. And we had it in a, in a sepia toned version of what our, our highly saturated colors in the, in the, in the self-driving car version were. Nice, nice. Um, so, so the, the sort of original thought experiment experiment has been criticized, but, but for being sort of art and this is true of any sort of thought experiment, but it has, has been criticized for being kind of artificial and importing a lot of theoretical assumptions in, in the way the question is framed and all this stuff. And I get, I get, I, I take your point that autonomous cars just are an applied example where the, the trolley from, problem frame makes sense, but, uh, from, from you all's point of view, are there theoretical assumptions about morality that are sort of imported in posing the questions this way? Like, yeah. you know, like, can you get at the relevant facts by posing the questions as these dilemmas? Yeah, by the way, I've never heard the thought experiment criticized for being too realistic. You know? So <laughs> it's not exactly <laughs> telling you something, but yeah, no, yeah, there, there are, of course, uh, things that we assume, for example, intro problems or in the wrong machines. I mean, the big one for me is uh, certainty. That is that uh, for some magic reason, you know exactly what's going to happen if you do this or that. There is uh, zero probability or uncertainty or gradation of things. It's, like, you know, this or this. And I think that's probably the, the huge one in those uh, surveys and in the moral machine experiment. The fact that we assume complete uh, omniscience about what's going to happen. Uh, is that uh, assuming on omniscience on the part of the person being surveyed or on the part of the, the vehicle? Person being surveyed, that they know that the, what the outcomes are going to be. Well, I guess that the vehicle is telling them the vehicle what the outcomes right. are going to be. Yeah. Right. That, I, that, I, that it is somehow knowable that if you, if you turn this way, exactly five people will 100% die. Uh, it's not a matter of injuries or black and whiteness or whatever. And if you just go this way, it'll be one person. And in the early discussions, we did discuss, you know, introducing uncertainty, introducing injury as well, like, so not just, you know, death. So you can compare, like, I don't know how many injured people, five injured per people versus one. But then you think, well, you know, what type of injury? And, you know, it just kind of explodes very quickly. So we, of course, whenever uh, somebody sees the, you know, often when somebody sees the moral machine experiment, they think, well, this is artificial because this, this, and this also can happen. But we had to stop somewhere and i think uh you know it's just by definition otherwise uh, it just becomes infeasible so 
you know, we, I think you could still learn something and then you could try out the variations uh, subsequently. Uh, and, you know, did we pick the most important ones? It's really impossible to know. Mm. So one, one place this came up is, is I know that there was a, a distinction between, um, I think it was a Kurt Gray, uh, how, how he sort of interpreted some of this, and he's got, he's got a, a, a bunch of work in, in moral philosophy too, in, in terms of how people think about it. But, but um, I think he, he wrote some response to one of you guys saying, saying if, you, if you frame these questions differently, you'll get different outcomes and you'll, you'll, people, people will make different kinds of trade-offs. Could you, could you talk about the way uh, the, the trade-offs people make about valuing all human lives equally and how that changes based on how you phrase the question? Yeah, so the, the lead author on that was a, a postdoc who was and may still be working with Kurt uh, Jochenan Bigman. Um, and what they did is, is they, instead of doing the large moral machine uh, website type experiment, they, they returned to the more standard um, survey methods, but they gave the option about, uh, would you rather all lives be treated equally uh, versus would you, and in the first version of their experiment, they had very heavy handed language for, would you rather kill this person rather than that person or whether, would you rather um, treat everybody equally? And in the second version of their experiment, based on kind of some of the suggestions we made, they, saw, they, they made the language less extreme. And what you did see is then you now have three versions, right? You have the version that we did, you actually have four versions. You have the version that we did, you have the first version that they did, you have the second version that they did. Uh, and then you have some other data that we'd collected in, in uh, using the moral machine, which is what was in our response to their uh, commentary. And what we found is that there's, there's sl variations between how people act, depending on how you frame the issue. Um, and I think that those variations are important, but they're important insofar as they're triangulating on something that we don't actually know, which is how people are actually going to react when these cars are available. All we're trying to do right now is approximate that, that reality, which we we can't yet measure because, well, we, we're not in a situation where those dilemmas come up uh, yet or whether the trade-offs, the actual trade-offs that will be involved come up yet. Um, by the time that those, those issues are real issues and we can actually measure the, the revealed preferences, whether people are buying the cars, whether the actual is outrage or not, um, in a way it'll be too late. Um, because, well, people will have already died at that point. And what we're trying to do is get in a situation where we can anticipate how people are going to react. Um, and so for all those reasons, I think that these are all imperfect ways of actually m measuring that, that reality, that revealed preference, which, which may eventually um, be recognized. But we're trying to triangulate on something which is, which is our best approximation of that. And, and using multiple methods, our methods, as well as uh, Jochenan's and, and Kurt's methods, is, uh, is a, good, a good way of doing that. Have you found any differences uh, cross culturally in how people make make these kinds of judgments? Like, uh, do, is it is it major differences across cultures? And then what, what's what's common across cultures about how people think about these trade offs? Well, one thing that's very important before we get into the cultural variation is to say that uh, okay, in the moral machine, we looked at nine possible factors right that would affect uh, the preference of people like uh, do you prefer to save men or women do you prefer to save child or children other adults things like this nine, nine things like this and uh, one thing that is extremely striking is that everywhere you look at in the world the preferences are always in the same direction you know so everywhere in the world people will prefer to save children than adults no the strength of that preference is going to vary quite a lot in different countries, but we didn't find a single dimension, I think, that for which we would see a reversal in different cultures. Maybe gender was the only one and it was like so close to zero anyway, that it was meaningless. So that was, the, the, I mean, the big yeah, preamble what... to the discussion of cultural variation is first to say this, right? Is, qualitatively is, is, it's, yeah, it's the everywhere the always, same yeah the directions yeah. are always the same got it okay so uh, what i was saying is it's this is good news because it means that there's no jurisdiction in which cars will you know will be required to be programmed to deprioritize children for example so it simplifies things but i think it, what it says is because of the variation in the strength of the preferences it means that the way you resolve conflicts between 
the different factors may be different. So if you have children versus adults, but the some one of the groups, the children are crossing a red light, you know, maybe you would resolve this conflict differently in one country versus another because the relative importance of these things is different. Yeah, so I guess uh, part of the, part of the relevant backdrop here, and this is why we introduced this idea of a coordination problem, is you're you're also talking about international coordination here about like what what kinds of norms will be accepted across different cultures and across different countries. Um, so th there's a sort of larger picture of, and I guess this extends beyond the realm of autonomous cars. I guess we'll we'll get there in a little bit, but there's this larger picture of what it will look like internationally for us to be coordinating with machines at all different uh, socio political scales. Yeah, so one example uh, to put this concretely, how how this might manifest is that imagine that these cars are developed in California, uh, that the main engineering is done in California, and maybe not even it being purposely programmed to result in a particular pattern of uh, accidents and fatalities. Um, but the way that the algorithms are created lead to, after all the data are aggregated, uh, some ratio of pedestrians uh, and passengers being killed. So maybe what you find is that um, fatalities for passengers, there's two, two passenger fatalities for every one pedestrian uh, fatality in uh, driverless car incidences. Um, that may be acceptable in a place where that's the moral preference. And you might see the cars sell well without outrage based on that particular ratio. But if that same algorithm is ported to another culture, say somewhere significantly different, so say it happens in, in India or something, if you're using the same algorithm, you might have a different level of outrage that the Indians uh, uh, have in, in buying those cars or in being stakeholders on the roads where those cars are, are being driven uh, than you have in California. And so what you, where you, whereas they might sell very easily in California, they might have, uh, encounter a lot of problems in, in India. It doesn't mean necessarily that you want to have completely different moral values in different countries, but you will encounter different resistance. And I would add to this that maybe the, I think the point is broader than just autonomous cars, right? Like this is, for us, autonomous cars are just like a an tangible example where these things play out very clearly and in a way that everybody can kind of easily understand and relate to. But I imagine that development of AI technology in general is going to involve these issues. There will, there will be technologies developed by the major players, you know, the countries that are um, at the leading edge of AI, and there will be everybody else. And uh, now, you know, in the past, they would develop products that would then ship uh, elsewhere. Uh, but now they're developing things that have moral uh, sort of character, moral, moral uh, nature, right? And, and this is going to spread as well. And there's a question about, you know, to what extent uh, is this okay um, or should be reconsidered, right? It's a, it's a bit like the autonomous cars play play the same role that the, the trolley problem would play in the more flaw. It's not that the trolley problems are about trolleys. It's, 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 it has implications for all sorts of other things. Yeah, um, and you can see the echoes, the, the, the echoes of uh, uh, Josh Green's point in Moral Tribes here to return to that, right? That was the, the, the question of how do you have these interacting different moral positions? Can you find a common moral currency between them? Yeah. Hmm. Um, okay, so uh, we talked about cross-cultural differences. We talked about framing effects. Um, how how do you? I guess so. So there there are different ways your conclusions could be implemented here. So one is at the level of the algorithms that uh, in the cars, but another might be uh, political regulations. How do you see? So once once you've made some discoveries about what what kinds of trade offs people are inclined to make, how do you see them being implemented? Like how do you make that information actionable? Yeah, I would say it's not really our um, expertise, right? Like we think, I think we're working from a position where understanding those preferences is better than not understanding them. And, uh, you know, in general, understanding, I mean, uh, legitimacy requires uh, some kind of educated citizens that understand to some level, you know, at least some high level of abstraction, what the issues are and what the trade-offs are. And then the you know the political system, and the media and all you know, civic institutions kind of have to play their role. And this is really a much more much broader question, I think, uh, than we can handle. And we when we're not trained in this, so this is why we kind of don't make any very pre specific prescriptions or suggestions. But we know that 
well, I think, I think, at least speaking for myself, I feel, I think that this is an important aspect, um, and that what we're doing is not sufficient. So I think taking what people think in the moral machine and then plugging it into code is definitely not the right answer. That I know. <laughs> I yeah, I had a very humbling experience in, in that respect. I mean. For uh, about two years, I, I served as the chair of the European Commission Committee to uh, make, to to advise on the ethics of self-driving cars and this kind of algorithm. And it was uh, very very humbling to see how complex that process was. Mm -hmm. You know, to you know, to assemble these legal scholars and ethicists and engineers and social scientists like me, and try to have everyone agree on at least a palette. Of options to suggest to policymakers that uh, that that is something that I'm not sure I want to do again because it's mm -hmm. very very difficult. Yeah, so so it, it's not straight. Having having this information is more useful than not, but having it doesn't solve the problems for you. And there's yet more coordination problems to be managed. And and yeah, in relationship to research to the policy and yeah, that's and the technology. Um, have have there so so there have been an, a few high profile uh, autonomous car accidents that have happened already. Ha, have you been surprised by or or to to what degree have you been, uh, yeah, surprised by how, what the reactions have been to the existing accidents that have happened? And I don't know if they sort of crystallize certain trade offs, but but um, has that has that changed how you interpret your data at all? Seeing real world examples. This might be an example of confirmation bias, but. Um... I feel like the reactions every time one of these things happens is pretty predictable from what the psychological research suggests would happen. Um, so uh, people tend to react very strongly to novel situations. They're very effectively salient. And that's what happens when a, uh, a you know, an autopilot, a Tesla autopilot a crash happens um, infrequently relative to how many accidents happen just by you know, non-autopilot human drivers, uh, but people react very strongly to them. One, one very salient example, I think, which was very interesting was uh, after, after our first paper came out, people started asking, and probably they were asking these questions before, they were asking the actual car manufacturers, well, in the trolley situation, what would your, what would your car do? And most, uh, most manufacturers gave what I think was the right answer to that question, which was to dodge the question entirely. Um, but, but not all of them did. So Mercedes, um, they were asked this question at a car show. The head of their, their safety uh, division for self-driving cars was asked this question. And he gave some, some very sort of vague response, which is, well, look, if, if it's all equal, uh, we build our, our cars for the, the passengers. So you know, if, if, if it's completely equal, we'll just save the passenger. If you could save the passenger, save the passenger. Basically, he said it, it wasn't a very strong statement at all. And then um, two weeks later, they issued a statement totally reversing that position because in the interim two weeks, there had been massive outrage on the internet. And that's, a, I think, a good, um, that was a predictable response to a situation where you're facing these particular dilemmas. In this case, it was the dilemma that the car manufacturers were facing, which is between producing a car that is going to appeal to the consumers, one that at least our data suggested people would want the car, which is self-protective rather than treating all lives equally. But of course, everybody who's not a passenger in that car is gonna want the car to treat all lives equally and not preferentially save the passenger uh, rather than the pedestrian, especially if it's a luxury brand like Mercedes. And so in that case, you had a uh, a, a sort of a, a glimpse of, of the uh, sort of reification of, of what our results showed in terms of how people's moral outrage uh, 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 shakes out based on, on these kinds of dilemmas. More recently, there was a paper by Julian DeFreitas and Mina Chikara, which looked at um, not this you versus uh, uh, you as the passenger versus other pedestrians issue, but some of the other um, issues that we covered in the moral machine. And they also looked at this idea of moral outrage, uh, showing that, well, when, when cars are programmed not to treat everybody equally, people, people get morally outraged, which is, I think, a, a now predicted and predictable response if, if we see this rolled out um, by the manufacturers. I, I think that we can anticipate 
very predictably where the outrage is going to be, which is a useful thing to know and a useful contribution of, of the psychological literature to make towards the, the kind of grand effort to get these cars out there. So before we move on to the explainability question, just because you mentioned it, um, and I, I realized I didn't circle back to this, um, there's, there, there's sort of a list of, of cognitive biases that people have, many of which come to play here, and maybe it would be helpful to enumerate some of them. So you, you mentioned this this sort of uh, salience bias, where it's like the many, 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 many car accidents that result from uh, you know human drivers go go unnoticed. The one that results from the autonomous car get, goes very very noticed, and this skews people per, pre, people's perception of their safety. What are some of the other kind of classic cognitive biases that influence how how people interpret the behavior of autonomous cars? One that we uh, published recently is the better than average average effect or usually superiority, which is that uh, a question posed by a report from the Rand Corporation a, few, a couple of years ago, asking when should the cars be rolled out when they are safer than the average human? Like, is it should they be 50, you know ten uh, percent safer, ninety uh, percent safer uh, before you do mass rollout? Assuming you can actually collect this data, which is a separate question. You can actually establish this fact. Um, and they did simulations and they showed that under many assumptions, um, rolling them out sooner is better because in part, uh, because you save more people in the interim and the cars also get to collect better data. So they, they can improve faster. And, uh, but of course, people um, always rate themselves, or well, people on average rate themselves as better than average drivers. And this is a broad, a well-known phenomena. Um, and we are, we've, we've replicated it here and we showed that it predicts people's uh, cutoff points. So how safe they want the cars to be before they were willing to adopt them. And you know that's another uh, bias that has nothing to do with dilemmas. It's just purely about perceived safety. And, at this, it, and we found that it goes further than what you would um, hold, the standard that you would hold a human uh, driver, for example, a taxi driver or, or an Uber driver. Uh, up to. So it, it, there seems to be something special about the standard that you hold machines to. So, so just to make sure, so, so the, because people perceive themselves to be better than average drivers, and the, the, the more that they do that, the more better than average that they imagine themselves to be, the later they'd want, the, 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 the higher the standard they hold autonomous cars to because yes. they assume themselves to be better. That's right. Perfect. So if you're, if you're, if the cars are only 10% better uh, than the average human, and you think that you're 40% better than the average human, but you're not, uh, why would you buy that car, right? So, so is it is a, a consequence of that, that everybody uh, is biased in the direction of adopting the cars too late? Because we all, like the, the, the overall bias, uh, individuals may have even greater bias, but the overall bias is still better than average. Yeah, the, the outcome of that, as well as some of the other things that Iad was referring to, uh, the, the algorithm aversion idea that people just really do demand more from, from the machines than, than human drivers, means that uh, people have extremely high requirements, safety requirements for the cars. At least they report doing that. We'll see if that actually ends up being the case. But right now, all the data suggests that that people are not willing to ride in these cars until they're extremely safe. And it might take a long time to get to that point. And in the meantime, uh, many, many, many people would have died. I mean, that was the outcome, that, that was the conclusion of the Rand Corporation thing. Hundreds of thousands of lives would be saved if you were to, if you were to roll out the cars when they weren't extremely safe, but they were just safer than the average human. And then no one would drive them. Back, back to the same dilemma. If, if people would behave differently, it would be better. But if they won't behave differently, it doesn't matter that that's the case. Yeah, okay. And it does feel another... like, so, uh, it's not clear to what extent the focus on safety in the rhetoric of autonomous cars is responsible for this. I mean, some research by uh, Berkeley Deed Force and others suggest that it's the, the expectation. So uh, because people expect algorithms not to make errors, that when they do, people have this kind of algorithm aversion. So if you if you don't set such high expectations, then you can presumably uh, reduce this problem, this kind of aversion. Mm. Um, There's also okay, so maybe, sorry, oh, sorry, Jake. Let ahead. me just jump in with one more one more of these heuristics um, or these biases. There's. There's one more, more recently discussed uh, bias called betrayal aversion. And there hasn't really been that much research uh, done on this in the context of self-driving cars, but the idea here is that people really dislike 
being harmed by something which is supposed to keep them safe. And so the example that was used in the original paper on this was, well, if your smoke alarm burnt down your house rather than your refrigerator, well, you're going to be really pissed, right? You're going to be more pissed than if it was your refrigerator. And then the other example they use, which is particularly topical, is people really hate being harmed by vaccines more so than they would be by the actual thing that the vaccine is for. And so if the self-driving car industry really sells the 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 major point of self-driving cars to be safety. And everybody's expecting that these cars will be safer than every time there's an accident, they will feel that, that betrayal aversion. They will feel like something which is supposed to keep them safe still gets an accident. It's amazing because of course they will. Um, but that's going to that's gonna sting more than if it was sold as a different type of, uh, having a different type of advantage. Yeah, I, I, I've also heard, uh, I think it's Jennifer Freed or Fried has this idea of institutional betrayal, but it's the same thing. If, if the institution is charged that's with right. protecting you and they betray you, that's all the more traumatizing than, yeah. That's, that's right. Fascinating. Um, has, has, anyone, has anyone applied betrayal aversion to the purchase of guns? <laughs> not, not, not that I'm aware of, but that's interesting, yeah. <laughs> But but okay. you don't you don't you don't take that's the gun to be, you don't take the gun to be an animate thing. Maybe that's the, the distinct like you take a you take an institution to be an animate thing somehow, like an agent somehow, but not necessarily a gun. Hmm. Hmm. But perhaps maybe maybe that's unwarranted. That's an interesting question. Okay. That's not a uh, weapon though. It's different. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Also. Well, so. So definitely. I, I bet. I bet you'll see more betrayal aversion when you have like you know drones that can then could shoot things you know that seem more like agents or something like that. Um, okay, I, I know I know we're tight for time because Jean Francois has got to watch Justice League. So let, let me let me try to uh, be quick. Um, uh, explainability stuff. So so there's the um, larger uh, discourse in in AI right now about so how do you make these uh, black box uh, algorithms transparent to people, be able to explain their reasoning to people. Um, this relates to the legitimacy project that we were talking about earlier, that if you can make the reasoning legible to people, if you can make it explainable, then people are more likely to accept it. Um, but there are trade-offs here between uh, explainability and, and accuracy or effectiveness at the level of the algorithms. And I guess um, I, I guess I'll just have you speak about this, this problem that, that it's, not, it's not the case that, that uh, the explainable algorithms are always the better ones or always the more accurate ones. Or always, they're, 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 there are all these different trade-offs between explainability and other virtues we'd like to have in algorithms. Or maybe that's not true. I see. I him, don't uh, think we've done things like on this specifically, right? Uh, the closer we got with the ad was to explain that, you know, sometimes the algorithm is going to give you an explanation that is not an actual reflection of what went on. Sometimes, you know, the question is, do you allow machines to sort of give you an explanation that's something that will convince you, but that's not actually what it did. But uh, but in terms of trade-off, I don't think we've ever done something yeah, to accuracy and explainability. But I think there there is re technical research in computer science on this kind of trade-off between explainability and accuracy, and there are there are papers on this. I'm not really familiar with the details of the literature. But I think from our perspective, we're trying to say that uh, what we're trying to promote is this notion of like behavioral transparency. So. Uh, you know, you may not have, you may not know exactly how the algorithm uh, figured out its, uh, you know, what caused its, it to behave in a particular way, but it, as long as you can build some kind of causal model of its behavior from the outside, uh, which could be completely behavioral, right? you could, you could make, uh, uh, subject the algorithm to like uh, experiments, and then you can find out what kind of things influence its behavior. And you build a, a theory of mind of the machine. This might be sufficient uh, for many applications to provide this need for explainability and transparency. Maybe it's a different trade. So there's the explainability efficiency trade-off in, in in the algorithm, which is like how effective is the algorithm at doing what it's doing against how explainable is it. But then there's this um, explainability, uh, this, this sort of accuracy trade-off with respect to what the explanation you give is, which is like, is the explanation accurately reflective of what it's doing versus being persuasive and, and, and uh, effective on the person that you're trying to explain it to? And those are, those are different trade-offs. And then, okay, so you mentioned, you mentioned you can study the algorithms in the very same way that you'd study people in order to figure out causal models of, of their behavior. Uh, 
that's as, as good a transition as any into this idea of this field of machine behavior that you've been instrumental in, in getting started. But but uh, it's interesting to see that field of ma machine behavior as part of this legitimacy project, right? Which is like in, in understanding uh, machines, the way we've understood humans and, and trying to come up with causal models of their behavior, that makes them more explainable, which helps with the legitimacy and the adoption projects. Is that sort of how you, was that one of the motivations for, for starting that field? Yeah, I mean, let, let's maybe clarify first that we didn't start the field, which maybe just kind of, uh, you know, things that have already been happening and uh, people have had different names for different aspects of it. And we think it's just a way of, uh, it's our way of sort of refreshing this um, uh, call to arms, right? That, that behavioral scientists can and should study algorithms um, and their interaction with people uh, as a legitimate object of study, right? That they shouldn't be uh, dissuaded because these algorithms have complex technicalities that they don't understand. They can still make a contribution by studying black boxes as black boxes, um, which complements what the engineers do, which is look inside the black box um, and tinker. So uh, the, the, the both, both aspects are complementary to one another, especially when you think about like deployed systems, because you, know, when you, you may very well understand an algorithm theoretically or uh, test it in simulation, but once it's released, it interacts with different kinds of environments, different agents, namely humans um, and institutions, and it's, its behavior may be different. So social scientists and behavioral scientists in general have lots of tools for studying behavior, and those tools should not be you know, uh, wasted. Um, they should be used on, on this problem as well. That's kind of, and in that sense, yeah, it, I think it helps um, establish legitimacy because in some cases you may never be able to, um, to completely predict the behavior. There are like theoretical results in computer science that, that tell you this, that tell you that you can't, there, there are limits. And this goes all the way back to Alan Turing. Like you can, there are computational limits to what properties of a machine you can verify a priori before you actually run the machine, run the algorithm. Right. It's a uh, it's the halting problem. It's, it's which is which is what he uh, uh, was one of the things that he was very famous for. So so in in the presence of these limits, computational limits, then behavioral uh, perspective of studying algorithms may be helpful. So can I say that we're not tech evangelists, or because when you speak about the legitimacy project or the adoption project, you make it sound like we're part of some kind of conspiracy to you know, push tech onto people. And I know that's not what you mean, but, but what I mean is that we don't see ourselves as you know, constantly trying to push technology to make people accept it. Uh, it's just that you know, some technology can do good. And when that's true, we must be uh, careful not to reject it for wrong reasons. Mm. And so I think our work is mostly about identifying the wrong reasons people might have to reject some technology that can produce some good. But that does not mean that there are no good reasons to reject it, right? Yeah, I, I, I think Yad said at the beginning, it's conditional, right? Like it's conditional on autonomous cars actually saving lots of lives and being effective that you would want to engage in the legitimacy project at right. all. Yeah. Um, okay, so one, one last question before I let you guys go. Um, and it relates to this explainability thing. Uh, there's, this, there's this question that comes up often, uh, whether the black box situation that we face with machines is actually all that different from the situation we face with our, our fellow humans, right? Like, like, and are the explanations that we give for our behavior accurate explanations or are they kind of social interfaces that allow us to coordinate better? Are there sort of folk misconceptions about human reasoning works that are bleeding into this this question of like you know what kinds of explanations AI should, systems should give and how accurate they should be? Are, are they analogous to the trade offs we'd face in just like explaining ourselves to other humans? I I think I think so. I, I mean I think that the best work going on on this. I don't think a lot of us have done any work specifically on this, but the best work I've seen is is. Um, the work coming out of Kerry Moore, which is lab. Um, I think the, there was a recent paper uh, by Romain Cardario and Chiana Langoni, um, which looked at exactly this issue, right? It looked at this perception about how much people, they were looking at me medical decision-making. Um, and what they found is that people were more accepting of a human making a decision about mole detection or something than they were in AI, but only because they were under the false assumption that they understood how a human thinks about these things, right? So they believed, and they did this really clever technique, right? So they, 
they said, well, how well do you understand how a, a human doctor does this? And how well do you understand how an AI would do this? And people said, oh, well, I understand a lot how a human doctor would do this. And then they asked them to describe it. And then people were at a loss. And then they asked them again, okay, now how, how well do you understand this? Okay, you know what? I didn't really understand the human. Um, in fact, I, now I only understand the human as well as I understand the, the, the algorithm. And so in that sense, I think part of it is that we are, we have this aversion and, and fear um, partly because of the black box issue towards algorithmic decision-making, but we also have, have this overestimation about our, the transparency of human decision-making and maybe the rationality and logic behind it as well. Um, and as a result, for, for, for both reasons, we are maybe privileging human decision-making over that, that of, of algorithms. Mm. I think to circle back to crashes involving autonomous, autonomous cars, I think it applies there too, that after a crash, like the Tepe crash where a pedestrian died, you can see that people immediately zero in on yeah. humans. Now, what was the safety driver doing? What was the pedestrian? How was the pedestrian behaving? Now, because the, the inner working of the car, the autonomous car, how it perceives the word, how it makes decision, is so obscure that people latch onto what they understand, which is that you should not cross a street in the dark. You know, that's not safe. Well, that doesn't mean anything. It's just it's a card that perceives the word differently than we do. So maybe it's not so dangerous to cross the street in the dark, but that people seem to think that is very hard to grasp. I, I, Hence I, the, the focus on the faults of humans in those very uh, delicate situations. I think this makes it kind of uh, imperative to understand uh, the theory of mind, the mind of the machine, uh, which is something that Jen Log has been uh, promoting as well and kind of thinking about. Um, so, and I think we were still in a very nascent stage. And the interesting thing is that, you know, humans have been around for a long time. And we, so folk theories of other minds have, have also had a long time to develop, but machines are changing very quickly. It's a very new development and they're changing as well. So it's really not clear how this dynamic will play out because, you know, you can have a theory of mind now of how cars operate, but then, you know, next year there's a different uh, software update and now they behave differently. Is, is is the so I, I now I, I realize what, uh, the trade offs I was confusing before. Uh, I think you talked about the the fidelity, simplicity, persuasiveness trade off. In in in, in uh, I can't remember which which paper that's in, but it's in one of your papers. Uh, um, in 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 explanation. So how accurate is it? How simple is it? Presumably, humans in giving explanations are also making fidelity, simplicity, persuasiveness trade offs all the time. Are there discoveries from how humans make those trade-offs that are like applicable to how it, how we might want to make those trade-offs with AI systems? I, I think in this case, it's not really how can we understand how humans do it and then you know try to apply the right mix to machines because right the, the important thing is what do we mean by right mm. in this context? You know, should the machine ever be allowed to you know fudge? with the explanation in order to make it more persuasive. It's more of an ethical question than a technical question or a psychological question. Is, is, that, is it really a good idea you know, to have machine intentionally lie to people? But isn't, but isn't, there, isn't, there, isn't there a coordination piece to that too? So, so it's like, like, like you, could, you could say the same thing about is, is, is shouldn't humans always only ever give the most maximally faithful explanations of their behavior? Well, if they're not going to be persuasive and, and useful for coordination, it's like it's, it's it seems like a, another instance of the same. Yeah, but with humans, it's not like you can make them do whatever you want them to do. Right. right. <laughs> That's the big difference with the machines. I see. There aren't there aren't the same kind of constraints on what you could get a machine to do in the end. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. I don't want to I don't want to take you any longer than I, than I said I would, but this has been super informative and, and exciting for me. So thank you all so much for your time. Is there anything in particular that I missed that you'd love to to leave us with? No, that was great. Those are great questions, Jake. Very thought provoking stuff. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. Yep. All thanks. Right. Take care.